Panasonic just released the S1H. It's what I would call the first 6K full frame hybrid cinema mirrorless. This could be bad for the Sony A7 lineup and possibly the Blackmagic as well. I'm sure you already know all about its specs. So in this episode, I'll spare you the overwhelming list of features the camera offers and I'll cut straight to what really matters to us as filmmakers. I'll talk about the impressive features and the claims you need to read with a little bit of caution. I'll show you how the S1H combined the best features from six popular cameras, yet slapped a hefty price tag that would easily throw a lot of filmmakers off. And finally, I'll talk about the soon to be released feature, the external RAW recording. And I'll tell you why it might not be exciting as you think. I didn't want the high-end specs of 6K and 14 stops dynamic range to distract me from the bigger picture of how well this camera is as a full package and how much it answers to my needs as a filmmaker and DP. I know this might be a long preview, so I'll leave you bookmarks on each section in the description below so you can skip to the point you need to learn more about. First, let's see where the S1H is placed within the Panasonic camera lineup. So Panasonic has the GH5 at the end of the hybrid mirrorless cameras for indie filmmakers, with the GH5S being more video-centric than the Vericam at the other pro cinema or Hollywood end of the spectrum, followed by the more recent EVA1, which can be called an indie cinema type of camera, with a smaller form factor, less processing power than the Vericam, but still powerful enough for a highly skilled filmmaker, which left an obvious gap for the cinema mirrorless that can bridge both worlds the serious indie filmmaker owning the EVA1 and looking for a B cam, and the indie hybrid filmmaker on the rise, who's growing beyond the GH5 capabilities and wants to step into the more serious cinematic realm, possibly without compromising the photographic capabilities of the GH5. Enter the S1H. Keep in mind, 10 years ago, the camera spectrum had very sharp lines distinguishing between cameras for an indie filmmaker and those for a Hollywood level filmmaker. Yet nowadays, those lines are getting more and more blurry with every camera release. I'm saying this as I noticed many filmmakers take a firm stance in categorizing whether this camera is a cinema camera or not, and wasting time thinking whether its features belong to that category or not. As a DP, I'm personally very happy with this battle between camera developers of bridging gaps and creating new subcategories, the result of which will benefit every one of us. Now let's see how the S1H combined many great features from six popular cameras into one. Starting from the GH5 and the GH5S, I feel the camera combined both cameras features sparing you the dilemma of choosing between which one to buy. The funny thing is, by doing so, you'll be paying the price of both cameras combined, something I'll tackle later in this video. First, the in-body image stabilization from the GH5, which I personally find a very appealing and welcome feature in a camera with that quality. Also the 180 frames per second in Full HD mode, I just wish they took the 240 frames from the GH5S instead. Especially that I'm sure that the camera is very capable of that. The dual ISO from the GH5S, then the flip screen, which they further improved to prevent hitting the HDMI port like in the GH5. Pretty much combining the best of both worlds, the tilt feature from the Sony A7 series, and the flip feature from the GH5S. It's a bit bulkier, but functionality wins at this point. And of course the small mirrorless form factor, and full HDMI jack, which helps in a professional setting. Now from the Sony range, the introduction of full frame is placing it as a direct competitor to the A7 series, which most of us agree that it's considered the video camera of choice if you're into full frame aesthetics. Also similar to the Sony, the S1H introduced the Super 35 shooting mode, which crops in the sensor to deliver better performance such as higher frame rate and lower image compression. And finally having a bigger full frame sensor, the signal to noise ratio becomes much higher, which would offer less perceivable noise at higher ISOs. I would still need to test that to compare it with the A7 series, which has proven to be pretty impressive with its low noise threshold across the board. The S1H is also competing with the Blackmagic 6K on the 6K resolution front. Hang on tight, as I'll dive a bit deeper comparing both cameras in a moment with some interesting findings. The S1H also inherited the amazing 4 to 2 and 10-bit color depth internal recording, like in the EVA1, which would make it the first full-frame mirrorless camera to have those high-end settings across many recording modes. And finally, it also inherited the full version of the V-Log V gamut from the Vericam, which is claimed to offer 14 plus of dynamic range. I have a lot of experience with the GH5 V-Log, which is a rather simplified version that is claimed to deliver 12 or 13 stops at most. And I'm very curious to see the technical differences between both. Of course, the S1H hosts a plethora of other features, and as I mentioned, I'm only talking here about the important ones that grab my attention. Now the question that many of us are probably wondering about is how does the S1H stand against the Blackmagic 6K? I know that they don't have the same sensor size, but that won't prevent us from comparing both. 
as I believe they are the highest performing cameras at the moment in the cinema mirrorless category, at least till we hear more news about the Sony A7S III. Keep in mind that the S1H has the Super 35 shooting mode, which would effectively be a fair comparison against the Blackmagic 6K, which as we know has a Super 35 sensor size. We know how the Blackmagic 6K effectively stole the S1H's thunder three weeks prior to its official release, with equally flashy specs such as 6K, RAW and 60 frames per second, yet in a much more affordable price. But of course the Super 35 sensor size and the EF lens mount were deal breakers for many filmmakers, including myself. With the current full features release of the S1H, the substantial differences from what we already knew are the dual ISO of 640 to 4000 and the in-body image stabilization. So let's quickly compare both cameras. First, let's check the sensor sizes versus frame rates. Sensor sizes are important as they dictate your crop factor and field of view, which was a major drawback in the Blackmagic 6K as mentioned in my previous episodes in the links below. As you can see, the S1H has an impressive 6K 3-2-2 recording mode that captures the whole full-frame sensor data. This is primarily useful for anamorphic shooting, but you can also use it with spherical lenses, allowing you to reframe a 4K 16-9 image, or even go creative and create a digital dolly or jib movement in post within that 3-2-2 6K frame, something that's very unique to this camera, I must say. The main limitation is you can only shoot at 24 frames per second, which works well for narrative content. And in terms of colors, it's limited to 420 10-bit, which is still a step up on the bit depth side from almost all cameras out there. But the video compression is set to long GOP, which means the 6K footage will be very heavy on your computer to process. Here's the 16 to 9 version of the 6K, which allows you to crank it to 30 FPS. And finally, if you need a higher frame rate, then you'll have to crop to the Super 35 mode to enable the Cinema 4K in 60fps in the same compression and bit depth. As for the Blackmagic 6K, as we know its sensor is already Super 35, which misses out on the aesthetics and field of view of the S1H's glorious full frame, but it pretty much destroys the S1H with 6K 50fps in its impressive 12-bit Blackmagic RAW codec, which doesn't apply any chroma subsampling, so theoretically leaving the image chroma at 444, yet with 10 FPS short from the S1H version. Or if you want to match the 60 FPS from the S1H, then you need to crop a bit more, sampling 5.7K of the sensor, to go for the ProRes 4K resolution, which comes in at 422 10-bit, which still wins at the chroma subsample front. So now you need to set your priorities between field of view, frame rate, and color depth. Would you rather go for full frame with relatively compromised color depth and low frame rate of 30 frames per second? Or choose the Blackmagic RAW codec with high speed of 50 frames per second, but in a tighter Super 35 field of view? Now let's talk dynamic range. Panasonic claims the S1H offers 14 plus stops of dynamic range. I would honestly take this with a big grain of salt. Let me explain why. I'll have to jump into a super quick bit depth 101 lesson to clarify. For the purposes of this explanation, the illustrations here are exaggerated versions of the effects of bit depth over the dynamic range. So first, we all know how the dynamic range is the ratio between the darkest and brightest part of the picture the sensor is capable of capturing, and it's measured in stops. As for the bit depth, it's how smooth the transition is between these darkest and brightest values of the given amount of dynamic range, which in our case is 14 plus stops. The higher the bit depth, the smoother the transition, the better the image will look. The quality of the transition is measured in bit value per channel, the RGB channels of course, and the number resulting from this bit value is the steps of luminance levels. So for example, the 8-bit has 256 steps, while 16-bit has more than 65,000 steps, resulting in smoother transition. So let's check the 14 stops the S1H claims to offer, and see where it stands against other cameras. On a 16-bit image, such as the one from a red camera, you get a super smooth transition which is more than enough for possibly any shoot you'll ever have in your lifetime. On a 12-bit image, such as the Varicam and the Blackmagic Pocket cameras, you get almost 16 times less steps, yet it's still good enough for possibly everything you'll shoot. Then in a 10-bit image, such as the S1H, it's almost quarter of the 12-bit, which is still better compared to most mirrorless cameras out there. And finally the 8-bit, which drops drastically to 256 steps, and that's found in the lower end setting of the GH5, which results in the image to break down much easier and cause visible banding much earlier than in a 10-bit image. The good news is that the 8-bit is what almost all mirrorless cameras out there are shooting on, which is already good enough for many of us. So now with the 10-bit, you'll start feeling a substantial improvement. The other great news is that the S1H is using the full cinematic V-Log V-Gamut color profile version that offers 14 plus of dynamic range, which would ideally need a high bitrate to stretch itself without breaking. 
but unlike the Vericam that can record in 12 bits, the V-Log Gamma Curve in the S1H will have to sacrifice the smooth highlight and shadow transition to squeeze those 14 stops in the 10-bit range, which would potentially result in the image to break down and express visible banding earlier than you'd expect while grading. As for the Blackmagic 6K, it has a smaller dynamic range of 13 stops, but a much better transition and roll-off due to the 12-bit depth. So based on the specs on paper, the Blackmagic should have a much nicer color roll-off and transition than the S1H, yet fall short by only one stop. So my theory is that the S1H sensor could be very capable of the 14 plus stops of dynamic range, but those stops would be found in raw photos only, not in the video, where I assume the camera will express between 12 and 13 stops at most. Again, this is my professional opinion as a DP who worked with the Vlog since the day it was launched in the GH4, and I would surely love to hear your comments on this theory. As for the chroma subsampling, the 422 10-bit internal recording being present in many recording modes in the S1H is surely an impressive advantage over all mirrorless cameras out there. This feature will mainly help in rendering more accurate colors and having wider latitude in post while grading or for chroma keying. But the good news for GH5 owners which is already capable of 422 10-bit internal recording, the S1H full version of the V-Log will offer a better look and improved gamma curve, at least as they claim. How much is this improvement? That's what I'll test and share with you when I get the camera. So this feature will make the S1H stand out against all other contenders such as the Sony A7 range that only resolve 4208 bit internal recording. No need to mention again that the Blackmagic RAW will also win this battle after all as it will not downsample the chrominance information to 422 or 420, but rather offer you the full chroma sample of 444 from the Blackmagic RAW format. As for the image stabilization or IBIS, I personally feel this is a very attractive feature that I always wished it existed in higher end cameras. And it seems this wish is coming true, especially after hearing about how Canon added image stabilization to the newly released C500 Mark II, a very unexpected feature to find in such a high end camera, not to mention also featuring their very high performance dual pixel autofocusing system, proving the point that those small features found in smaller cameras are making their leap into the pro world. So having the IBIS feature in the S1H, I can now use cinema lenses with a stabilized full frame camera for the very first time. Not only that, but you can save the lens profile, which controls the amount of image stabilization based on the lens projection circle on the sensor. Or in plain English, you can dial the IBIS up or down to prevent any vignetting happening due to the movement of the sensor. With IBIS in mind, a compatible optically stabilized lens, relatively steady hands, and possibly minimum rigging, you might not need to use a gimbal as much as you did before. So well done Panasonic. But again, the small catch, their impressive claim of 6.5 stops of stabilization is only possible when combining the 5-axis IBIS of the body with the 2-axis optical stabilization from the compatible lenses. Now let's check another bold claim of future enabling the external RAW recording. Okay, so Atomos announced that it's in co-development of RAW recording over HDMI, but the main issue now is that the HDMI output of the S1H is limited to 4 to 2 10-bit, which raises many concerns about how much of an improvement will result from this RAW recording. The only improvement I can think of is that the external RAW recording will prevent the camera from applying the lossy compression of H.264 or H.265, whether in all eye or in the temporal compression of long GOP, which honestly will not result in any substantial or perceivable difference in quality. As for the cons, first, with a 4K output, you're losing the 6K recording resolution, which I believe is one of the two main selling points of the camera, full frame being the other point. Second, if your output is 10-bit, then the camera already sacrificed the two extra bits of information before even reaching the recorder. So recording a 10-bit in a 12-bit RAW container would result in zero improvements in the bit depth. Same applies to the chroma subsampling. If you're already reducing the RAW sensor chroma data from 444 to 422, then again, RAW recording would not bring them back. So you'll end up recording your same footage in a bigger and heavier file size depending on which RAW format they'll end up with, which I can almost guarantee it's the ProRes RAW. Not to mention the price tag of the recorder and media, which was announced to be the Atomos Ninja V, costing almost $700 and $200 minimum for 500 GB of SSD media. And knowing Panasonic's history with firmware upgrades, they'll probably charge you at least another $100 for it. Finally, it's also worth mentioning the inconvenience of rigging the monitor and almost doubling the size and weight of your camera. So to me, none of this makes any sense, since you can already record that 4 to 2 10-bit internally. The only hope we have from that news is that they either enable raw sensor data transfer over HDMI through firmware update or follow the Blackmagic protocol to record directly on SSD through the USB-C port. So my advice, don't let this news of undeveloped raw recording feature affect your decision in buying the camera 
till they officially announce it and see their final offering. Let's talk about price now. I was honestly surprised of how Panasonic stood its ground of $4,000 after Blackmagic announced their $2,500 6K camera. Keep in mind another important factor as well. This camera comes with a brand new Leica L mount, which means you're probably one of the vast majority of filmmakers who don't have Leica L lenses, which leaves you with three options. Either to invest in pricey yet awesome Lumix Leica lenses, such as the 50mm for $2300, or the total of $6300 for this basic setup, or get the same lens in a more affordable yet still great quality L mount Sigma version for $950, with a total of almost $5,000, or if you already own EF lenses, then you can simply buy the Sigma M21 adapter for a more reasonable total of $4,250. So let's imagine the last scenario and see how much the $4,250 investment will get you in this amazing time we live in as indie filmmakers. One option would be getting both GH5 and GH5S along with a Micro Four Thirds to EF Metabones adapter of your choice, which would amount to $100 cheaper. Another option would be buying both Blackmagic 4K and 6K along with two Samsung T5 SSD 2TB each with a total of only $60 over the price of the S1H with an EF adapter. The point of what I'm doing here is not really to show how expensive the S1H is, but rather to shed the light at how we're pretty lucky to live in those days where you can buy awesome cameras with options such as RAW recording in a very affordable price. So who is this camera for? Probably the first target is filmmakers who love full-frame aesthetic, which would mostly describe the Sony E7 camera owners. Also hybrid photographers filmmakers who will benefit from the 24 megapixel photo mode, or indie filmmakers with handheld style who would like to experiment with non-stabilized lenses such as cine lenses on a stabilized body. Also if you're a low light shooter, possibly weddings, or simply you prefer using practical lighting in night scenes, or anamorphic shooters who can now use anamorphic in a much more compact setting, possibly experimenting with new ways to fit the camera in weird places for more creative angles. Also previous Panasonic camera owners upgrading from the GH5 or GH5S to a more powerful A cam or B cam for EVA1 or Vericam owners. So my final thoughts, the S1H is a great step in the right direction. The pros are having the first full frame mirrorless camera with 4 to 2 10 bit internal recording, 6K 3 to 2 mode with multiple anamorphic D squeeze options, full version of Vlog V gamut will hopefully be a substantial upgrade from the GH5 version, in-body image stabilization to be the first in a professional grade camera of that caliber, dual native ISO is also a very welcome addition with potentially greater ISO performance than the GH5S due to the full frame sensor size. And finally, the honorable mentions of smaller yet awesome features that had filmmakers in mind such as a new articulated screen with tilt and flip options that prevent it from hitting the HDMI port, like in the GH5. The screen is 150% brighter than the S1, so probably more usable outdoors if it gets close to a thousand nits, which I doubt. Top screen for easy referencing of basic camera settings including audio meters, scalable waveform monitor overlay, 2 hours of battery life, unlike the very short 30 or 40 minutes from the black magic of course, and the ability to power the camera and charge the battery with the cable over USB-C while it's still rolling. Despite the fact that it has a fan in the back, the camera is weather sealed, which makes it splash and dust resistant. All this, and still being a legit photography camera with 24 megapixels, the color science of which yet to be tested. Now for the cons, as I explained, I have strong doubts about the look of the 14 plus dynamic range that would fit within the 10 bits. I gotta test them myself, unless as I said, they really meant it for the raw photos. I hope I'm wrong. When it comes to high frame rate, I feel it underperformed, which shows when you shoot 4K at 60 frames, it's limited to 420. I mean considering that it should have a beast of a processor that required a fan to cool, having to record 60 frames at lower chroma didn't really add up. Also on the same note, I felt it was a bit strange having the GH5S beat it with 240 FPS versus 180 in the S1H. No raw output over HDMI, I know that's a rather pro cinema camera feature, but Blackmagic already broke that rule with raw internal and external recording. Maybe the USB-C port has some unlocked magical potential yet to be discovered, let's hope for that. The camera's autofocus is still contrast based. If it's the same as the one in the GH5, then it's pretty bad, borderline useless. I just used the photo feature in the GH5 last week on a shoot and it was a very frustrating experience, especially after getting used to the Sony a7 III. This could be a major drawback for indie filmmakers who depend on the autofocus when the camera is mounted on a gimbal or in action scenes. Finally, the $4,000 price tag is a bit off budget for many filmmakers, 
especially that we're dealing here with a new lens mount, a lens mount that's not really offering anything extra other than the Leica brand name, which easily loses to the RF mount from Canon, which adds a whole new set of features to the camera. Now with many full-frame cameras in the market, each with their proprietary lens mount, such as the Sony E mount and the Canon RF mount, and now the Panasonic L mount, choosing a camera became a much harder choice than before, as you need to consider whether you're planning to invest a lot more money in native lenses and benefit from their optimum performance on the mount, or opt for adapters and lose some of the perks that might be crucial to your shooting style. Overall, I'm really happy with how Panasonic worked hard this time to make this camera work for filmmakers right out of the box. Just like all other cameras, on paper, the S1H surely has many pros and cons, some of which can be accepted as they are from the specs sheet, while many others need to be field tested to be confirmed, such as ergonomics and usage on a shoot, image quality, and how well it handles in post. Keep in mind that choosing a camera should always be based primarily on your style of shooting, and what features make more sense to you. You'll always find yourself in a tough position choosing between cameras with many great features and deal breakers. So remember, there will never be a perfect camera, at least not yet. I should be getting the camera sometime soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you get notified when I upload my full camera review with test footage, where I'll put all the theories I mentioned here to the test and hopefully answer more of your questions. I would love to hear your opinion about the camera so far and whether you're planning to buy it or not through the poll up there or in the comments below. Feel free to follow the channel's Instagram if you want to stay up to date with future episodes and for more behind the scenes from my ongoing shoots. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.